and considering this Datsun Roadster has been on the road for 15 years since its restoration, it's a credit to the work done to see it still looking so good. The Datsun 2000 Sports has a 5-speed gearbox, a 2-litre, 150-horsepower engine and will happily cruise all day at 100 miles an hour. Reliability was also a selling point. Originally designed to compete in the American Sports Car Championship in a 12-hour Sebring race in Florida, the 2000 Sports was built to endure long-form racing conditions. This racing pedigree has withstood the test of time, and these little Datsun Roadsters are famous for their up-and-go, while other Roadsters of the same era are often breaking down. The cars were only ever sold in Japan, America, Australia, South Africa, and a few cars were sold into Finland for some reason or other, we're not sure why. But uh, there were about 30 odd thousand sold in the States, two and a half thousand sold in Australia. And these days, very, very hard to come by good examples. Most cars in the 70s were thrashed pretty hard by young guys because they were cheap to buy. Uh, they went quick, so people bought them, crashed them, and uh, now most examples that you buy uh, have been rebuilt a few times and they're full of um, you know, plastic. So it's very hard to come by a very good car. Like most roasters, the roof is really, really great for keeping the sun off your head, but not much good at keeping out the rain. It's believed the best way to keep dry in a fair lady is to drive faster, a notion rarely complained about by their owners. What they did offer the new car buyer though was great design and performance inside and out. For starters, the car had a top speed in excess of 200 kilometers per hour, or just over 125 miles an hour, pretty quick for its day, and much faster than the British roasters it was competing against. This was most likely due to two factors. The buying public was still infatuated with British roasters from MG, Austin Healey and Triumph, and pricing was competitive. Also, the Japanese car maker had yet to cement its reputation as a quality car builder, and it needed time to develop and prove its product would last through the years. We all have to agree though, this little Japanese roaster sure looks the part now. And as far as classics go, they can be had for a song if you're happy to do some work on them. Although a fully restored one like this beauty will set you back as much as a new car today. And what's the best thing about driving a car like this one? I really enjoy it. It'll be one of the last things I do before I die, I'm sure, is to drive one of these cars. And uh, I, uh, I'm sure if you had one or if you can get a chance to drive one, you'll really enjoy it. Here's a challenge for all you classic car fans. Know Your Chrome gives you a peek at some close-ups of classic Chrome. Look at the shapes. Do you recognise the lines? Can you tell which car sports this shiny styling? It's too early for clues. But we can tell you it's a car, it's a classic, and it's very, very cool. Look closely, and we'll give you more hints later in the show. Next on CC, the Classic Car Show. A barn find that's made it back on the road. A Porsche grade of tomorrow, and a groundbreaking US classic. The great thing about owning a classic car is that you don't have to be an expert or a mechanic to keep it maintained or restore it to its former glory. With simple four-stroke engines and basic electrical systems, classic and vintage cars are relatively easy to work with and almost anybody can roll up their sleeves and get a few jobs done. Take Neil Frost for example. He's only just 18 years old, yet he recently took up the challenge of restoring a 60-year-old vintage as part of a school project. About eight months ago, I found a 1948 Morris 840 Series E up in a winery. I've been working on it as part of a school project and done a few things on the engine, converting it from 6 volt to 12 volt, 
and also fixing the brakes. Of course, undertaking a project like this is no mean feat and Neil sought out local experts to help him along the way. So I had a member from the Morris Register come and help me work on it and also the neighbour across the road helped me uh, work on the brakes and also yeah, just converting it from the 6 volt to 12 volt. And any queries I needed I would always ask the member from the car club. As with any old car that hasn't been maintained for years, it's important to make sure the brakes are in good working order before hitting the road. So this was one of the first jobs that Neil tackled. The first job I did on the car was remove, removing the brakes. That meant taking off the brake drum, the brake shoes and the wheel cylinders. And then I took them to a place where they were reconditioned. And then that, when they came back, I put them all back on. When Neil first bought the car, it had a six volt battery, which are very hard to find. So his next job was to convert the car from a six volt to a 12 volt system. The headlights and indicators also needed replacing, as well as other parts like the fuel pump and the volt regulator. As we can see, the upholstery on this car does need a bit of work, and Neil plans to do a course with the local car club, where he can learn the skills to repair the wear and tear on the vehicle's seats and panels. There's a few members in the car club that have done the course and have been willing to teach me, so at some stage I'd like to learn to reupholster the seats. One of the reasons Neil chose to work on the Morris 8 was that, although the car was built in 1948, it's still relatively easy to find spare parts. Luckily, many of the parts on this vehicle are the same as those found on its successor, the incredibly common Morris Minor. Parts are generally inexpensive and easy to find on the internet, so it's a good car to work on as a beginner. Yeah, it's a good car for a beginner to work on. They're very simple, not too complex. The modern cars like today are very, there's wires everywhere and just they're very hard to sort of get your hands in where these are just straightforward. You've got the engine, wheels, it's pretty much what a car is. One day Neil plans to spend some time on the bodywork by removing an odd dent and even giving the whole car a respray. But for now, Neil's just happy to have completed his project and got the car roadworthy. The best thing about working on this car was that I got to finish it and now I get to enjoy driving it. As it was easy to work on, it didn't take too long. And now I can just sit back and enjoy driving. What you are looking at here is a classic of tomorrow. This is the Porsche Panamera. When Porsche announced this vehicle in 2009, there was a wave of controversy around its design. Critics were less than impressed with its unusual lines. Opinion, it seems, is cheap. Sales of the sleek four-door sports coupe with a hatch have surpassed everybody's expectations and have ensured that this unique vehicle goes down as a future classic. So why is a four-door hatch so popular? Well, it's a Porsche for a start, and when it comes to aspirational purchases, Porsches are often at the top of the list. Then, of course, there is the sell factor. The key, we think, to this sports car success is its practicality. We are guessing most Porsche buyers are males over 40. Therefore, they often have wives and kids. So what kind of sports car can a family man really buy without looking selfish? Here it is, the Porsche Panamera, today's classic of tomorrow. And why is it a classic of tomorrow? It seems every Porsche becomes a classic. So on this one, we're just going with the flow. What you are looking at here is a Lamborghini Miura, one of only 300 or so left in the world. Credited as being the first commercial mid-engine sports car, only 764 Miuras were built between 1966 and 1972. Miura was an important design step for the Italian car maker. While company founder Ferruccio Lamborghini wanted the company to create powerful sedate touring cars, three engineers, Gian Piallo Dallara, Paolo Stanzani and Bob Wallace developed the prototype in their own time. It went on to be a hit in the 1966 Geneva Motor Show, 
and body stylist Marcello Gandini got most of the credit. The Miura was a vehicle firmly placed between decades. Classic 60s styling combined with some 70s experimentation. This resulted in a car that was truly unique. Some consider the pop-up headlights to be a fad of the time, but in actual fact were a necessity. For the car to be legal in some countries like the USA, which had regulations on minimum headlight height, rather than restyle the body, the headlamps would raise up via small electric motors. The Miura was the epitome of 60s chic and everybody who was anybody wanted to be seen in one of these exclusive cars. Frank Sinatra drove a Miura in the late 60s, as did UK model Twiggy. In fact, this car we are looking at now is said to be her car, which was custom ordered from Lamborghini in 1970. For the Italian car maker, the Miura was a giant step in performance cars. There was such demand for the vehicle, the company could have kept selling them well beyond 1972 when they ceased production. So why did they stop? Well, Lamborghini was a small, boutique car maker who couldn't produce more than one model at a time. And they had a worthy successor in the wings, the Lamborghini Countach. So how well did you go with your first peak? How well did you know your chrome? Here's a quick update. Did you guess it right away, or are you still pondering? Take a look at these shots. We're showing you a little more of the car here, so you should be able to pick it. The answer is coming soon. Next on CC, Classic Cars, we reveal the Know Your Chrome mystery car, then it's over to wine country to catch up with a nice red. Some cars seem to be locked into a time, even though they span several decades. When most people look at the lines and designs of this classic American sports car that seems to ooze more muscle than hustle, they think 1980s. Surprisingly, this incredible example of a Corvette Stingray was built in 1968. This just goes to show how far ahead the design of this car really was. It's common for a name to travel over decades of car manufacturing, but rare for the car to go relatively unchanged. The body styling on this model continued for 15 years, longer than in any other Corvette. What makes the uh, 68 Corvette unique, it's the start of a, of a new model, new year. Uh, it started the, uh, what they call the bottle, uh, Coke bottle shape. Uh, what it makes it unique from other Corvettes of that era uh, is little subtleties to the, uh, the design. Um, things like uh, reversing lights on the bottom valance panels uh, that's not on any other model uh, right up to 72. Uh, it is a chrome bumper, it's what we call a chrome bumper model and they finished in 1972 and then after that they were rubber bumpers. Built by Chevrolet, the Corvette Stingray was groundbreaking in its styling and performance. One of the most recognisable muscle cars in history, the Corvette Stingray was a true evolution of American sports cars. A break from European influenced two seaters to a true American classic. So, how does this car differ to many others of its time? First of all, for a car built in the USA, the Corvette from day one had a unique body construction. Those styled fenders, low lip, and smooth lines are crafted from fiberglass, even as they were in the 1950s model. Many people don't realise that the Corvette Stingray has always been a fiberglass bodied car, hence its stunning power to weight ratio. Part of the reason the stylists of the Corvette were so far ahead of their time was that they were not constrained by the steel construction limitations of their peers. The organic lines and free curves are pure imagination.
many fans of the Corvette Stingray grew up watching American television shows, where the car often had the starring role. This has helped fuel the passion for the muscle car across the globe. Fans of the car love its beautiful shape, clean and flowing lines, and no matter what angle you look at it, it's a lovely car. This is most likely a deciding factor in the design's longevity. This particular Corvette Stingray is quite unique. You would be hard pressed to find an original car. That is to say, all the parts in this car are as they were from the factory. Sure, it's been restored, but it's as stock as the day it rolled out of the showroom. Some purists may note that the steering wheel is not original for this car. Well, Gary has this restored, but is reluctant to use it day to day. And how much would a car like this cost? Well, when they rolled off the factory floor in 1968, the manufacturer's retail price was around 6,000 US dollars, which equates to about $36,000 now, or about 22,000 pounds. The early Corvettes have appreciated due to their popularity, and this example would fetch about 80,000 US dollars. There are some very rare Corvettes that have sold for more than 800,000 US dollars, but these are few and far between. The power plant under the hood is also a little unique. It features a Holly Triple two barrel carburetor, or tri-power carburetor on a big block engine. The motor in the 68 Stingray came in several different varieties of 427, a small block and a big block. It also came in different horsepowers. Not only is this a big block, but also the 400 horsepower model. There is no question, the American muscle cars were in a style class all of their own. While the European car makers were staying small and sleek, the muscle cars were all about looks and a powerful performance. And when you put that much power in a relatively light vehicle, something has to give. What's the car like to drive? I mean, it's, it's, it's very basic. Um, it, is, it, it is a 1968, so the, the technology's not there like a new car. Uh, but it's like sitting, once you're in there, it's like sitting in a, in a, a cockpit of an aeroplane. Uh, you're very low down and the bonnet uh, is very, very long, so it, it, is, it is a, takes a bit of getting used to to see over the, uh, over the front. In a straight line, it's, it's magnificent. Uh, out in the open road with the top down, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely free feeling. Um, it's not that uh, terrific when you come to cornering. It, it, it's, it's not a good cornering car. Uh, it, the, the back end tends to want to uh, uh, swish out its way out a bit if you, if you give it a bit of gas. But uh, out on the open road, as long as you're going straight, uh, it's a beautiful car to drive. It's not every day you see a car over 40 years old rolling out of a winery and feel the twinge in your neck as your head turns just a little too far. It's cars like the Corvette Stingray that help keep the passion for classic cars alive. So how well do you know your chrome? If you said it was a 1976 Porsche 911 Carrera 3, you'd be right. The classic 911 shape has held true for decades, starting way back in 1963. Some of you will be wondering just how you were supposed to pick the exact model. Well, it's the bumpers on this beast that are the dead giveaway. It seems we are surrounded by classic cars. We can't believe how many classic cars are still on the road, but we do know why. Classic cars hold special places in the hearts of so many. Memories of visits to the beach as a child, buying your first car, or getting into the seat next to Grandad as he warmed up the engine of his old clunker. Few mechanical things can evoke so many emotions and memories and give lovers of old metal a chance to relive the past, a past preserved in CC, classic cars. <laughs> 